amen. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Let's give God some praise for the praises that go up, that God blesses us. Let's give God some praise for Vessel. Amen. Did an incredible job in setting the atmosphere right for the word to go forth. We are excited and encouraged tonight as we believe that God is getting ready to do some miraculous work. A miraculous work. Amen. Almost got through off. Got a new clock back there. Don't have the right time, but it's a new clock. Amen. Amen. I was like, wait, wait a minute. It can't be 10 minutes after 2. Uh, it's 7.32. Amen. And uh, getting ready to say, wait a minute, what's going on? Uh, but we'll make those adjustments and make them right. Amen. There is a word from the Lord that we're going to share with you on tonight uh, that I believe uh, God has brought forth for this season and for such a time as this. Uh, as we share it with you, we were going to uh, be preparing a message uh, that was going to minister to all of us in general, but in particular going to be ministering to men. Uh, but God changed uh, that agenda and that we are now uh, going to preach another sermon uh, that he put in in the last minute changed it up and so I, I'm just ready to do what God called me to do and that is in preaching the word so turn with me to Psalms 22 uh, we're going to lift up Psalms 22 uh, verses 1 and 2 and then we're going to go over to Psalms 23 read verses 2 3 and 5 uh, when you found it once you stand to your feet as we get ready to read and reverence the word of God Psalms 22 Psalms 22, verses 1 and 2, and then turn over to Psalms 23, 2, 3, and verse 5. The word of the Lord reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out. By day, but you do not answer. By night, and I am not silent. Psalms 23, verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And then verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. I want to preach from the subject, I can't keep living like this. I can't keep living like this. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, I know he's right about it. Amen. I can't keep living like this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful, powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit in this place. That we are here gathered together, assembled in one accord. Because we know where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. We feel your presence in this place. Truly, there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and we know it to be the spirit of the Lord. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, healing, and deliverance. Use me, O oh God, as you see fit. Hide me behind Calvary's cross that Christ may be elevated. And as we lift up the name of Jesus, you said that you would draw all men to yourself. And we pray to that sinner that doesn't know you and the pardon of that sin. That as they hear this word, they would come asking the eternal question, what must I do to be saved? Then, Father, we pray for the saint who's troubled, perplexed, who's ready for change. I pray that this word would minister to them in such a unique and powerful way that they would be able to make the changes in their life necessary for kingdom work. And I pray for that sa saint who's comfortable, who's relaxing and not serving. I pray, God, that this word would convict them, that they would get off of their flowery bed of ease and serve in this portion of your vineyard. We stand in awe of what you've already done. We are greatly anticipating the mighty work of the Holy Spirit in this place. Do it, O oh God, as you see fit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, my brothers and sisters, 
anybody who is serious about changing their lifestyle and their environment ought to have a deep desire for change that they can believe in. A lot of us have heard with our own, even our own voices, make many false declarations that we are intending to change, only to discover that we are remaining the same. You know what we do. We say that I'm not going to do this again, and next thing we know, we find ourselves in the same trap, in the same situation, in the same circumstances. But it's not until you get, you, you get sick and tired of your own environment and your own situation that you make up in your mind that I don't have to continue to live in the doldrums of despair, but I can live in the grace of God and move in the power of God that he has set before me. S the thing and thing I'm challenged by and that I look at and that I see is that I cannot believe that all that is, all that where I am is all that I have. There's something inside of me that causes me to want to do more and go more and do more than what I've seen. That with all the purpose that I have in my life, all of the drive that God has given me, all of the passion, I know that God has endowed me with greatness inside of me. That, that my life is not just going to consist of working a nine to five job. That my life is more than just paying bills and having substandard places to live. That our lives are much greater than where they are. The fact of the matter is the Bible says that the earth of the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And here is that I'm not talking today about people who have inflicted pain on you, but instead today I'm talking about what we have opted and selected for ourselves things that we have chosen, things that we have seen. It, it's not until you get tired of being broke that you do something about being broke. It's not until you get tired of being undervalued until you decide to do something that is valuable. It's not until you get tired of being on a dead-end job that you decide to make some changes in your life. It's not until you get tired of being wrapped around in the same kind of habitual lifestyle that you make up in your mind that when you look in the mirror, I want to see something different. You have to say to yourself at that moment when you're looking in the mirror, I can't keep living living like this. Would you just repeat that in the atmosphere? I can't keep living like this. You have to ask yourself and you have to ask yourself the question, aren't you tired of bouncing checks every week? Aren't you tired of just getting up going to work for somebody else? Aren't you tired of having to punch the clock to make it just to make it to survive? Aren't you tired of just living just to get by? Having to investigate even the friends and wondering if they got good intentions or bad intentions? Aren't you sick and tired of living in a place of life where you're not moving, where you feel you ought to be moving, when you know that God has so much more for you than what you're experiencing? And when you get sick and tired of that, you will make up in your mind, I can't keep living like this. While I've been preaching, I had to drop my anchor down in Psalms 22. And in Psalms 22, it arrested my attention for what I'm going to be sharing tonight, because in in Psalms 22, it is a foreshadow of what is what will happen at Calvary. Everything that we read from the reverberations of the heart of David are the sentiments of Christ on the cross. Let, let, let me see if I can walk you through Psalms 22, and, and you're going to hear some things that are seemingly familiar and passionately apart from the Easter narrative. Look at me, if you will, at Psalms 22, and you we're going to begin at verse 1 where David says, my God, my God, has thou forsaken, why has thou forsaken me? This is the exact same thing that Jesus echoed while dying, being on the cross. Have you ever been in a place, my brothers and sisters, in your life where you in fact felt like God had forsaken you? I mean, for real, for real, you didn't mean any disrespect, but you just felt like God was blessing some people who, in your own humble opinion, did not deserve to be blessed the way they were being blessed. But at the same time, while you were struggling and you were trying to be faithful, H have you ever been at a place where you felt like that you had been lifted, you've been lifting up your prayers, but your prayers were not being answered? He says in verse number one, he asked the question, why have 
have you forsaken me? Then he goes further and says, you are far from helping me, but not only are you far from helping me, but you are far from hearing me. I'm not talking to those of you who are self-righteous this afternoon, but I'm talking to those of you who are really authentically genuine in your walk with God, where it is that you feel like that not only is God far from you, but you can't hear the voice of God, that even if God spoke right now, you would have to second guess and ask the question, is it really him? Because it's been so long since I've heard his voice. I'm in Psalm 6, 6 chapter 22, verse 6. He says, I'm like a worm, David describes. He says, I'm the lowest decimal of a specimen. He says, I can't even walk upright. I'm always trying to scrounge around, trying to find something to eat, trying to find shelter for my life. He says, I'm not even a man. I'm far less than a a human being. He says, I'm a reproach of a human being. I'm despised by other people. Have you ever felt that way where you felt less than what you were because you could not produce what God was calling you to produce? Have you ever been at that place where you know that you could not operate? You felt bad because you were not operating at the level of intelligence and charisma that God has given you. Nobody gave you an opportunity, but you was striving to seek what God had for you. Look at verse number seven. Still in Psalms 22, he says, I'm scorned of men. That men, the men he's talking about, people are talking about me. He's saying that don't even know me. People are depressed, are despising me, and they don't even know what it took for me just to get out of bed this morning. Verse number seven, he says, I'm mocked by men. People are talking about me, and here's what he says. He says, I know I don't have everything that I know, but I'm not what they're talking about. He's looking at a place where he's looking in his own life where people, he's saying, I don't want to be in a place where people are judging me all the time. I want to be in a place where people know my heart and understand that what I have on the outside doesn't define who I am on the inside, that my car doesn't define me, that my house doesn't add value to me, but I am a person that looks for deep within and know that I'm a person of worth because God has made me a person of worth. I'm in verse number 11, Psalms 22. He says, he says, God is my only hope. Have you ever been there where you felt like you were at the bottom of the bottom and the only way out was the hope in God? Have you ever been there where friends who you thought were your friends all of a sudden begin to back up away from you when you were in need? Where family members who know you're struggling but they won't even lift a hand, a finger to help you to get to where you're trying to go. People who are you thought were your friends but they're not your friends because now they're in your hour of need where you've helped them all the time. They're too busy to come and help you out. They're looking, trying to figure out what is your problem. Here's what you need to understand, even what David understood. He said, I know my own mother and my father forsake me. That's when the Lord will lift me up because he understood the greater love than no man had than these that man that lay down their lives for their friends. God is my only hope. Would you just elbow your neighbor and say, he's all I got left. God is my only hope. He's the only hope I have left. I can't trust in money during this time because money will fail you. I can't trust in education because education won't get you everything that you need. The only thing I can trust in is the God of my salvation. God is my only hope. Look at verse number 12. It's a, He says, and brutal men are around me. I'm talking to those of you who are in dangerous and demonic environments. He says, says, but in spite of the environment you're in, he says, you're going to still be able to keep your spirituality intact. See, some of us are in a place where it's almost impossible on our jobs to even play gospel music. People will look at you crazy. You try to lift up. They listen to anything and everything all day long, but with the moment you turn to WLOU, all of a sudden you are holy roller trying to t- they tell you to turn it down. We don't like listening to that kind of 
music. You need to turn it down. They act aggravated and unnerved. They are surrounded by brutal men, David says. People who know your weaknesses, they will use it against you in a moment of vulnerability. When you shared it with them, you was at a place of intimacy. And now that, we, that you're falling apart, now they're trying to use it to sh your shortcomings to now get the best of you. He says, I got brutal men around me. You will go do what it takes to, people will do what it takes to push your buttons because they're trying to just get a reaction out of you. When you know, they know that you're sensitive in that area, but yet and still, they're going to push your buttons. And here's the thing, you would think you would even be able to come to church and nobody would mess you, mess with you, but you find yourself in church and you're sitting around people who are not being blessings to you, but they're becoming a burden to you. That's what he said in Psalms 22, chapter 22, verse 12. Now I'm in verse 13. He said, now I'm surrounded by men who are trying to destroy me. And I'm talking to some people who are not just dealing with rumors, but now you're dealing with some people who want you dead. There are some people literally that want you dead. They're not going to be satisfied until you lose it all. That's when they, they are insensitive. They're not looking at what you have. They're looking to take everything you have. And you're trying to figure out, what did I do to make you that mad at me? Just because I'm trying to live my life for God, would you look at your neighbor and say, don't, don't get it twisted. Somebody wants you dead. Somebody wants you dead. But here's the thing. I can tell somebody, as bad as somebody wants you dead, God wants you alive. That's the good news because if they had it their way, you would have thrown in the towel a long time ago. Had they had it their way, you would have you would have checked out a long time ago. But God still has his hands on your life. I'm just talking about Psalms 22. They wanted me dead. They thought nobody else would love me. They tried to convince me that nobody else wanted me. He understood that. Would you just do me a favor? Would you just shout for everything that you came through that should have killed you, but you are here today through it all? You are alive, even though somebody wanted you dead, but you're still alive. Would you just do me a favor and just give God some praise? Just say, I thank God that I'm live. I live through it. I thank God that I'm still alive. I thank God that it didn't destroy me. Would you give somebody a high five and say, I'm still alive? I'm still alive. You don't understand what I've been through. I'm still alive. Would you look at another person and say, listen, tell them that somebody left me for dead, but I came to tell the devil in his face that I'm still alive. You thought it was going to take me out. You thought it was going to destroy me. He says he's trying to destroy me. Everything I try to do, he says, is far away from me. But here's what I love about David. He says, I'm still standing. You ought to just give the devil a nervous breakdown right on a Wednesday night and say, listen, I'm going to give you a nervous breakdown and shout in your face. I thank God I'm still alive. Somebody just shout, I'm still alive. For years I've done drugs, I'm still alive. I was running with crazy people, but I'm still alive. I was raised in a crazy house, but I'm still alive. I'm still here in spite of what the enemy tried to do. See, if you've ever been in a car accident and you're here tonight, you ought to shout because you are still alive. I'm still alive. I'm in verse 14, Psalms 22. He says, my blood life is being poured out of me. My bones are out of joint and my heart is broken. He's saying in no uncertain terms, my brothers and sisters, and I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you just felt sick. You were sick, but here's the thing. Nothing was wrong, but you just didn't have the energy anymore. You, you didn't have the energy even just to get out of bed. I, I, I don't know where you are, but I just feel you in this church, this tonight, that, that, that you are sick. You were sick. Or you're sick of fighting. And, 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 and here's the thing. You people are trying to come after you, and you're sick of fighting. you just at the point to say, well, whatever. Just have it your way. I, I don't have that much energy left to fight over something that's so frivolous, something that doesn't even matter. Listen, I'm, I gotta, I'm, I, my head is in a headache position right now. 
and you're saying my heart is broken. I can't even trust the people that's around me. I can't, I can't even give my heart away anymore because the last person that I trusted with my heart, they tore it apart. But aren't you glad that God can put your heart back together again even if somebody left you? God can build you back up. Let me move on to verse 15. He says, my strength is gone. He says, I don't have any energy. My, my strength is gone because even though I got an idea of wanting to do something awesome for God, I just don't feel like doing it. I just, my strength is gone. Would you just look at somebody and tell them, I can tell your strength is gone. You ain't moved all service. I can tell your strength is gone. You, you, your strength is gone. You, you, you don't feel, because see, if your strength was here, you'd be clapping. You don't even feel like giving God praise. Your strength must be gone. You don't even feel like shouting no more. Your strength must be gone and depleted. All of your energy is gone. But see, here's the thing. I can tell you feel drained tonight because here's the thing. If you are drained tonight, get sit beside somebody who knows how to praise God because there's something about a praiser that's contagious. When I give God the glory, I, you don't know what the next time I shout, I'm going to give God glory until you start praising him. Because see, I know it's something about worshiping him that when I worship the Lord, there's something that shows up in the atmosphere. Would you look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm getting my swagger back. And watch this. You're going to get yours back. We're going to make it together. We're going to do the doggone thing. I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. I'm not going out by myself. I know we're going to make it. Listen, I know I made some mistakes because here's the thing. I came to church tonight on a day in July and I said, you know what? I wasn't going to shout tonight. But when I think of his goodness and all oh, he's done for me, I can't help but to give him praise. I got to shout from the top of my mouth and let everybody know I serve an awesome God. Would you look at your neighbor and tell him I got joy when I think about all he's done for me. I got joy tonight. I fought through enough already. I've been through some things. I've been through some challenges, but I still give God the praise. Why? Because I feel like lifting him up tonight. I don't know about you, but I came to give him praise tonight. I got to lift him up. Lord, fill my cup and let it overflow. Fill my cup, oh God, and let it overflow. Fill my cup, oh God, and let it overflow. What's the matter with Jesus? You didn't hear what I just said. What's the matter with Jesus? He picked me up and turned me around. Would you look at your neighbor and say, listen, you can keep staying there living like you want to, but I want to tell you, you can't keep living like this. You got a change in your mind. You got a change in your heart. You can't keep living like this. You got to make up in your mind that I'm changing tonight. I'm not going home the same way I came in. I'm going to live for God, and for God I'll live, and for God I'll die. I'm just about finished. Let, 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 let me cross over to Psalms 23, and, and, and I'm going to close with this because because I, I believe God wants to do something tonight right in our midst in this atmosphere of worship. And, and I'm going to take Psalms 23 and I'm going to just take two words out of, out of various diverse verses that I read for you hearing. And in verse 2, he says, make me. He says, make me lie down in green pastures. I just need somebody to shout, Lord, make me. Because sometimes when you're going through and you want to change in your life, God has to make the change. You can't do it yourself. You got to say, God, I'm ready to change, but I don't have the strength to change. Lord, make me. Create in me a clean heart. Lord, make me anew. Lord, make me do what you called me to do. Lord, make me. But not only does it, does the text says, make me, uh, somebody say, lead me. Because the Bible says he leads me in the path of righteousness. And that's what I'm getting ready to do. God's going to lead you. Let me, give you. let me give you an illustration. Have you ever been lost and, and you was trying to find your way out of an area that you know you wasn't supposed to be in in the first place, but, but the directions that, that you thought you had didn't make sense. So in frustration, you ask somebody, would you lead me back to the highway? I was trying to get some gas, but I don't know where. 
where I am right now. And they said, yeah, I'll get you back. Won't you just follow me? In other words, they said, I'll lead you back, but you got to follow me if you want to get there. And all I'm trying to say, God says, I want to lead you out of your situation, that I don't want you to stay where you are. In other words, God has to lead you, but you got to be willing to follow God. But the next thing he says, guide me. Somebody shout, guide me. He says, guide me. He says, guide me in the path of righteousness. Now, here's a fundamental question that I know that you are asking in your mind. You're saying, guiding me, and he says, leading me. What's the difference between guiding me and leading me? Here's the difference. If I'm leading you, that means that I'm in front of you, and you are following me. But if I'm guiding you, that means I got my hands on you, and then Therefore, I'm guiding you through this situation. In other words, God has his hand on you tonight. Not only is he leading you, but when you can't even keep it to yourself and stay in the line and follow God, he will guide you. He'll put his hand on you and get you through the doggone thing. But then I love what he says in number four. He says, comfort me. Somebody shall comfort me. Because, see, when you're trying to make a change, it's hard in your life. And God says, I want to comfort you through the change. I know you don't like what's getting ready to come forth, but I'm going to comfort you all the way through it. You got to recognize that God will comfort you in the midst of your changing. But here's what I love. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about, he says, anoint me. Somebody shout anoint me. I want everyone just to lay hands right on your head tonight because God's getting ready to anoint you. See, here's the problem. The reason we don't understand it is what would happen was the sheep, they would be in the field grazing by the cool, warm water, and because the water was cool, all of a sudden, flies would fly around the sheep, and what would happen, it would get in their nose, and and the sheep would then begin to take their head and hit it up against a rock to try to get the, the flies out of their nose, but then the good shepherd would come along, and he would anoint their heads with oil, and the oil would run down, and they would no longer have a distraction that they can change in their life but they wouldn't have any distractions of flies. They could have a change in their life. They wouldn't have any distractions of people coming into their lives. And so as you anoint yourself tonight, you don't need a pastor to anoint you. God is anointing you. Lay hands on your head and say Lord anoint my head until it's overflowing and as it overflows, remove every distraction. Remove Remove anything that hinders me from becoming all that you called me to be. I'm declaring that every person who's here that has their hand on their head, that you don't have to worry about what's getting ready to take place. God is in control. He's leading, guiding, and directing you that you're going to be able to walk and not faint. You're going to run and not get weary. Why? Because you're waiting on the Lord. He's going to renew your strength because in him I can do all things. I can do all things but fail. I can do it through him. I don't know where you are. But God brought you here tonight because you, could, you cannot keep living the way you've been living. And God says, I brought you here tonight so that change could come forth, so that, that your, lives, your lives would be different than the way that you came in. Because you recognize that the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit is on you. The anointing is in this place for change to come forth. But here's the thing. You have to receive what God has for you. And not only do you have to receive it, but you have to believe it, that you can truly experience everything that God has for you. But you got to know that you got to walk in what he has. I'm going to invite everybody to stand. The doors of the church are open. God brought you here because he had change in mind. He brought you here because he didn't want you to go home the same way. Because you cannot keep living the way you've been living. God ordained this moment for change to take place. He's given you the power. But you got to walk in that power. He's given you the opportunity. But you got to choose to walk in what God has given you.
If you're here tonight, praise the Lord. Come on, my sister. Praise the Lord. You got to walk in. God is changing some things right now. Is there another? God didn't bring you here by accident. He didn't bring you here through a coincidence. He brought you here with purpose in mind. Changes on the horizon. But you got to learn how to walk in what God is changing for you. You ought to come. Tonight is your night. The doors of the church are open. Take that step of faith. I'm available to you. You ought to come. Don't let this moment pass you by. This is your time. God is speaking to you right now. Are you ready to receive him? This is your time of change. This is a way you can go back home different than the way you came in. But it begins with change. Take that step of faith. My storage is empty. This is your moment. My storage is empty. I wouldn't go home the same way I came My in. Storage is empty. Won't you come? My 